Hey guys, so um, this video really isn't going to be attached to any assignment, uh, but it is an important review of some of the things that are going on um, in the book, um, especially some of the real life history that's um, affecting what's happening in the book. Um, and this is real life history that is actually still with us today in a very uh, significant way, even though the book takes place you know, decades ago, um, this is history that still affects people today and, you know, affects people uh, right now and um, that kind of thing. You know, people are dying, um, you know, this year, last year because of, in part, some of the things that the book is talking about right now or uh, will be talking about soon. We're probably not quite there yet unless you're a little bit ahead. Um, but in some of these upcoming chapters, um, we're going to you know, see these characters talk about some of this history uh, that for them is not history, um, that uh, is still really important today. And um, it's just good kind of background knowledge, you know, not only for the book, but just for being a good citizen of the world and especially a citizen of America because um, America has kind of taken a stewardship of some of these um, complicated, complicated issues. And, you know, in our American way, we've made some of them even more complicated. So um, this is really going to be focused on some of the uh, history going on in the Middle East during the time of the book. Um, this becomes a source of tension and conflict between uh, Danny and Reuven and their fathers. Um, and we're, we're probably not there yet unless you're a little bit ahead. But, um, you know, this way, when you get there, you kind of have some background of what's going on. So, um, where's my cow? Here we go. Um, so, in The Chosen, later on, um, in a couple chapters, I think starting around chapter 13-ish, if I recall correctly, exactly what number it is. Um, after World War II, there's a real um, extra emphasis on a movement that had existed for a while. Uh, to create a um, place, a nation for um, a physical, um, you know, country for Jews to live. And um, so this is a real life historical thing. And we're going to go over some of the history of the area, including the area um, that we now know as Israel and Palestine. Palestine. So, um, I'm going to put this PowerPoint up on um, the, 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 the classroom documents or chosen reading documents section so you can reference it. Like I said, there's no real assignment um, attached to it, but it's an important thing to just kind of know. Um, so let's kind of dive into it. Um, here we go. Hold on. Let me. Oh, wait, I need to. No, this, this is. Oh, oh, my goodness. Even when I'm at home with my own technology, technology is an issue for me. I mean, you'd think that I'd have it together at least a little bit at that point, but can't even do that. So, you know, bear with me. Uh, here, oh, go share screen. <laughs> there we go. Oh, it's all coming together now. Oh, but of course the, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 the menu went away. Boom, slideshow. Now we're ready. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to talk about the land uh, that is now uh, what we know. What is going on? Why is it? Oh, come on. Com okay, there we go. Whoa. My computer is freaking out right now. I don't really know why. What, what the what? This isn't working for me. Okay. You know, if I was more technologically so, so we're just gonna not go through it as a PowerPoint because apparently, so you know, Mr. Manzana has a very old computer. As a matter of fact, my computer is almost as old as some of you. Um, ooh, wait, that's really bad. Oh man. Um, and um, I think we went over before how um, you know, don't have a proper version of uh, Word or PowerPoint, so you know, got to go with the little cheapo version. So here we go. Uh, Israel, a very incomplete history. Now we're going to start way back in the past because um, that's where this, I, so when people talk about the idea, originally when I talked about the idea of Israel and even sometimes now, um, they start way back in biblical times uh, because 
this is an area the Jews were known for, um, known to have lived in and that kind of thing. And so um, there is a connection to thousands of years ago. Uh, we're gonna talk about that and we're gonna skip forward a little bit. Um, and then uh, lastly, we're gonna kind of hit some of the more, uh, some of the stuff right before the time of the book and the, during the time of the book. And um, we're gonna skip to the last few decades very, very briefly. So here we go. Um, here's where we're talking about. So this is obviously Africa right here. Uh, we have uh, the Arabian Peninsula. We have Iran in the Middle East, uh, the bottom part of Russia between the Caspian and Black Sea, Turkey, uh, Syria has been in the news a lot. Iraq obviously is a, is a location you guys probably know. And then we're really focused on this region right here, sometimes called the Levant. And that's in the zoom in here. Now you see this little spot right here, this little spot in gray um, is uh, Palestine and the United States doesn't believe it exists. So uh, the UN does, the US doesn't. So this is a non-American map. <sighs> um, but you know, it is what it is. There, obviously there's been a lot of um, uh, things in the news about this region, basically always, because there's always conflict and trouble. Uh, but in the last few years, there has been even more because the United States decided to move um, our embassy to Jerusalem, which has been uh, a source of conflict for a lot of people. So uh, there we go. Now going way, way back. Oh, why is this overlapped? Oh my gosh, almost like I should just pay for the right one. Anyway, um, so this area has been civilized by uh, people for thousands of years. Um, and uh, actually, I was reading an article a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, they found what the, that, so it was like, a, it was definitely like a clickbait headline. I mean, it was from like a reputable source, like probably New York Times or something like that. Could have been, yeah, probably New York Times. And um, they were saying like they found the first fast food place ever because they had found a place where um, it was a store that was making, um, it, was, it was pretty clear that it was an establishment, a restaurant that was just making a chicken um, and like chicken to eat and stuff. But when they found these bones, uh, the bones were kind of scattered all along what they realized was a street near the storefront. So it, people were buying cooked chicken and taking it and like walking off with it, like, you know, a drive through before cars, a walk through. So, um, you know, this is thousands of years ago. And um, so human history has been in this area for a very long time. Um, and then, uh, as we can see, about 3,000, 2,500 years ago, uh, there were, in this region, there were lots of different kingdoms, including a relatively small and not super powerful kingdom throughout most of its history called Judea. Um, this is featured in the Bible, as well as other historical texts. Um, obviously, uh, Jews were known for living there, and um, they were typically never the most powerful uh, in the region. Uh, typically, their, uh, their neighbors, um, the Assyrians, uh, which is part of now Syria, the Egyptians were both powerful, the Babylonians a little bit further north uh, were powerful at different times. And actually we see um, some of these come up in uh, religious texts like the, the Torah for Jews and the Bible, and then of course the Quran as well. Um, so um, some of these events are actually depicted in the Bible, the Assyrians conquered Judea. I think we talked about the Assyrians in was it you guys or my sophomores? Uh, we talked about how the Assyrians would uh, get, when they took over a, a town that would not surrender to them, they actually had to battle the town. Then they typically won at the time because they were the most powerful um, military force in the region. They would get the giant spikes in the ground, like, you know, 30, 40 feet high, and then they'd stack bodies and X's. So, you know, you could see this like tower from, you know, miles away. You're like, what is that tower? It wasn't there before. Then you walk over there and you're like, oh God, it's just stacked dead bodies. It's horrible. And then hopefully your town will surrender to the Syrians and just like give them tribute and stuff instead of like battling it out and making your own little tower of people. So um, I think we somehow that came up in class. Anyway, the Syrians conquered Judea. Uh, Eventually, the Romans come in later, so you can see uh, we're talking about you know more than 500 years 
um, before um, the birth of Christ. However, um, more closer to this uh, time, uh, the Romans took over, you know, 700 years after that, and they took over this whole region in one of their main wars of expansion. Um, and this is why the Romans are uh, involved in the events of the Bible um, or events in the Quran that took place during Jesus' life. Um, and then um, there were a number of conflicts and uh, revolts from the Judeans against their Roman rulers. Um, that is partly because of ethnic and cultural tensions, um, also because of anti-taxation protests, very American. And, um, you know, there is destruction of temples and, you know, rebellions against that, those kind of destructions. And uh, there is a series of rebellions, including some that last years. Uh, the Romans typically won. Um, and uh, then there were more rebellions and the Romans won again. Uh, and again, and there were typically stricter and stricter punishments. As a matter of fact, um, during one of these, uh, I think it was the third one, um, there, well, during this time, there started to be somewhat of an exodus. There was an earlier exodus during the Assyrians, uh, at the time of the Assyrians, but this became more prominent uh, during the time of the Romans, the kind of a second wave, and um, you know, an exodus, a movement of the people. Thank you, Bob Marley. Um, and um, even before this time, there was already significant Jewish populations living in other parts of the Mediterranean. Alexandria had a lot of Jews living there. Um, and so, you know, when you read about like Cleopatra and stuff, um, there is a strong Jewish population there, a notable Jewish population. But um, by the time the Romans kept on crushing these rebellions, by the third time, Hadrian, who was emperor at the time, was so upset with the Jews, he decided he wanted to wipe them out of history. And so he had maps and things and documents changed. So it didn't say Judea anymore. It said Syria, Palestinia. That's actually where we get these names. It was from this uh, Romans just being so upset. They're like, we're going to wipe you off of not only the earth with our, you know, killing in these conflicts, but also um, out of histories and out of maps, you won't exist even in writing. Um, and so it was a pretty, you know, the Romans got upset. Um, and so one of the things that happened was that after this, there was a diaspora. Now, an exodus is, is mostly typically um, uh, a more of a voluntary thing, but um, and a lot of times it's in one general direction, not always. But um, what happened here was there was a general spread, not just in one area, just kind of like everywhere. And so Jews were already living in Iran, but you see them in Iran, even make it to India, um, in um, Africa, uh, especially the northern rim of Africa. They go to Spain. There's a significant Jewish population in Spain, other parts of Europe as well. Um, and what this does is because they used to have a kind of more concentrated um, an area of not only people and population, but also kind of religious control, not, not control, but um, leadership and physical places and buildings and temples that were more important. What happened was during this time when that was really put down very violently and multiple times by the Romans, um, that shifted the way that um, Jews really kind of organize themselves, especially along religious lines. And so um, instead of having priests associated with temples and people who are uh, kind of um, in control of or monitoring or stewards of these buildings, uh, it just became kind of local community leaders uh, like rabbis. Well, not like rabbis, they, they were rabbis. Um, and um, this kind of spread continued um, for the next, you know, 1200, 1500 years, uh, as more people, as, as Europe becomes more you know, civilized, as it becomes more, you know, Romanized and um, more developed in terms of like roads and towns and stuff, we see that um, spread kind of Jews are following that as well. Um, a lot of times within towns or um, especially cities, there'd be kind of smaller enclaves of uh, groups of Jews living within the like communities, within a community. Um, 
and Jews were almost always a minority, but sometimes they became a significant minority. Um, in Iberia, this is definitely the case. That's the, the Spanish Peninsula, so it includes Portugal, um, Germany, the Middle East, the Caucasus, or in like Russia and like Georgia, not the state, the country. Um, and so there's this spread um, of Jews throughout different parts of um, Europe. And, and typically um, because um, so during the like Middle Ages and you know, the, the Dark Ages um, in Europe, most people were not literate because um, there was no very little need for it. Um, and a lot of times any need that there was was either a very clerical or like it was just for your job or it was like a religious need. Um, but religious needs were different because for like 1500 years well the bible wasn't written when jesus died but for until you know uh around the 16th century uh the bible and even longer than that for a lot of areas uh, the bible really wasn't written in the languages that people spoke it was it was continued to write in latin actually my mom in the 1960s she grew up catholic um she recalls when it was a big deal uh, when the Pope, during her childhood, said that Mass, like the services on Sunday, no longer had to be given in Latin, and like it made people really upset. Uh, my mom wasn't upset, but you know, she was a kid, so who knows. Um, so, you know, Latin was a huge deal, and so if normally you're speaking a language that isn't Latin, you're speaking like Middle English, or Old English, or, you know, Ancient French, or Gaelic, or, you know, Middle German, or whatever, um, that's what people spoke around you, but then they're all reading in Latin uh, for religious purposes. You know, what's the point of reading if, you know, you're not going to read the Bible because you're not a priest. It wasn't done. Um, this is actually one of the things that Martin Luther, not um, MLK Jr., but um, like the 95 Theses on the wall, Martin Luther, Protestant Reformation kind of thing, uh, the Protestant split. Um, that was one of the things he was upset about is because it kind of made knowledge so esoteric that um, people couldn't be as in touch with their religion and their spirituality because it was all this part of this, you know, secret language. I mean, it wasn't secret, it was Latin, but, you know, people didn't speak it and it was hard to get trained in it and that kind of thing. So um, now the difference was that throughout a lot of this time, um, Jews typically did uh, read and oftentimes then also write because studying the Torah and the Talmud were important for, uh, and re recitation from these, these texts were important for a lot of their um, religious services and ceremonies. Um, and so typically the Jewish populations of um, any area were more literate and, than other um, communities or other people in that area. So the percentage of people who could read and write uh, who were Jewish was much higher than the percentage of people who were Christian, or those are the main two religions uh, in Europe during the time. I mean, Christian was just the dominant, Jewish were a small percentage. Anyway, um, and so oftentimes um, Jews could get secular work, work, you know, non religious work that involved reading or writing because they already had reading and writing skills. Um, and often they also had numerical literacy because it was kind of, they're not the same obviously, but you know, if you're already working with symbols and letters, it's not that much more difficult to work with symbols and numbers. Um, and so, you know, even if they have to learn, you know, a little bit of Latin, they already know one language. Once you know one, it's easier to learn the second, uh, as I'm sure you're all experiencing in your world language classes. I know it's difficult, but at least it's not English. English is like the worst language ever to learn. It's, it's silliness. All right. Um, okay. So, and this, you know, actually leads into what we were reading in chapter six, seven, when um, Reuven's dad goes on that whole long history of um, uh, the Jewish people in uh, Northern and Eastern Europe um, and, the, and the persecution they faced. That's kind of a, so what I was talking about kind of leads into that. Um, and then we're gonna skip ahead to kind of more modern history. Now my modern, I mean like 1800s. So, um, and this is really the beginning of the Zionist movement. Now, 
Uh, Zion is literally a hill. It's a place you can go to, um, but it's often used metonymously, right? And so it's referring to the Holy Land, right? The same way when you're reading the news, it says like, you know, the White House decided, like when the White House is a building, it didn't decide anything. We just use it as, you know, this kind of placeholder for the administration, the people in the White House, the officials who make these decisions, right? So, um, this idea of Zion isn't just this hill, it's this whole area and this idea of a holy land or a place where, you know, this idea kind of tied to this idea of Judea that we talked about earlier. Um, and so this idea of Zionism had kind of obviously been around, people knew of it, like, not like this guy invented it. But in the 1890s, um, Theodore Herzl uh, came up with a idea that gained a lot of popular and recognition when he said, hey, let's have this Jewish state. Um, now, during the time that was, uh, and of course, they knew that Judeo came from the Middle East. There, people are looking at the Middle East. Herzl's kind of thinking about this when he comes with this idea that, you know, Jews should have their own, um, you know, country, their own nation. And um, they're looking at the Middle East, and right at that time, it was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire, for hundreds of years, was an extremely powerful nation-state empire. It was just one of the more powerful, not only in Europe, but across the world. Uh, however, it probably peaked in power in the 15th or 16th centuries. Um, then it was powerful in the 17th century, but um, really Spanish gold really hurt it because the um, inflation and the economic uh, change from the gold coming from the new world really kind of messed them up because more the Ottomans were, let's see if we can go back here, um, the Ottomans really were centered around Turkey, but and that meant they really controlled a lot of the European end of the Silk Road. And so you can imagine if that's, you know, a really important part of your, the economy of your empire, and then all of a sudden there's just the equivalent of hundreds of billions of dollars of, you know, um, gold and silver pouring in from the new world, you know, Mexico, South America, from when, um, you know, Spanish, the Spanish went over and, and took over those areas, the Portuguese, um, that kind of stuff, then um, that's going to really accelerate the decline. There were other things going on there. Their military structure was weird and their taxation was weird. They wound up carving up, you know, too many um, exceptions to their taxes and couldn't get things together. Their military training kind of went downhill. It was, anyway, um, so by um, the late 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was very weak. And actually uh, the Ottoman Empire's kind of last gasp was during World War I. Um, where they allied with um, the losers, uh, which, you know, if you're trying to uh, keep your country alive, don't ally with losers in a world war. Um, well, first, don't be in a world war. It's deadly. Anyway, um, so what happens is when um, during World War I, um, the British, who controlled like the whole world at this point, I mean, this was like the height of the British Empire, the Edwardian era. Um, and um, what happens here, I think I actually have a book, where is it? Oh, if I knew where it was, I'd show it to you guys, sorry. Who is, who wrote that? Anyway, a really interesting book about, um, oh, here we go, Lawrence, like Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence and uh, this whole region because this whole region was really important. So yeah, really interesting book, highly recommend it. If you're interested in Lawrence of Arabia, Scott Anderson's book uh, is very engaging. It's uh, a real life account of a real person, T.E. Lawrence, who uh, you know, we now fictionally know, as, well, not fictionally, but you know, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, he was a British uh, commander. Um, and so if we look back at our map real quick here, our bigger map, um, you know, if the Ottoman Empire is based here, they controlled a lot of um, things in the Mediterranean. Obviously, that's going to be important because if in World War I you're fighting against Germany, uh, you can't get in through the Black Sea and kind of come at Germany from the other side, which would be really useful because the Ottoman Empire is there. And so the British are like, well, if we could get to the other side of Europe, get up into the Black Sea, then we could come in on one side with, you know, uh, attack, um, uh, come in one side, attack like from France, 
and fight on the Western front. And we can maybe even open up a front in the East and kind of squeeze Germany, Austria, you know, her allies that way. And, but in order to do so, we'd have to control parts of the um, Middle East. And when they knew the Ottoman Empire was weak, so maybe they could do this. Um, and so um, the, um, at the time, the British Empire was divided into regions and quadrants. And there was a quadrant that was based in Cairo, which um, the British controlled. And uh, one of the leaders, the British leaders there was, um, was he a military commander? It might've been just like a, a regional governor, um, McCone. He starts a correspondence with uh, King Hussein of Saudi Arabia, well, it wasn't, was it Saudi Arabia at the time? Of the Arab Peninsula. Um, and uh, the Arabs had long chafed under Ottoman rule. Um, Ottomans were actually, for most of their rule, really good rulers. And like, so right, right now we have all kinds of conflict in the Middle East. And people are like, oh, there's always been conflict in the Middle East. I mean, yeah, on the broad scale, but like for 600 years under the Ottomans, there wasn't. 600 years isn't nothing. So, I mean, clearly there can be peace there. Anyway, um, but... Um, as the the empire changed and they looked for new ways to do things they, their relations with uh, the arabs uh got less good and so the arabs were eager to look for a way to uh, get out from under ottoman rule and so macomb the british guy's like hey if you help us then we'll help you we'll give you your independence and you help us overthrow the ottomans and then we can go in there and uh, defeat the, the Ottomans. You'll get your independence. We'll get to, um, you know, not only defeat a major ally of the people we're fighting against, but we'll also be able to get this really important passageway into Europe and attack um, our other European enemies from a different, uh, you know, a whole different front of the war. It'll be great. Um, at the same time, unbeknownst to Macone, um, a, another um, British official was talking to a French official um, and they were like, hey, um, what if we get and take over this Ottoman area or what if we just win, win the war and when we win the war, the Ottomans will be defeated and uh, we'll take over this Ottoman area and wouldn't it be nice if we just took over the Middle East? And uh, the French were like, yeah, that sounds great. And literally, they're like just drinking whiskey, and they come together and they draw lines on a map. And you know, this obviously isn't the best way to plan world affairs, um, but <clears throat> you know, imperialist Europeans, what are you going to do? Um, hopefully, learn from their mistakes, not repeat them. But you know, we'll see how that goes by the end of the lecture. Um, so this is actually a map of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, right? So uh, France was going to get some of the Middle East, um, England was going to get some of the Middle East, and um, what you're going to notice is that uh, in this description, the the Arab um, you know peoples aren't mentioned at all because Sykes and Pico were like, you know, so what? Which you know is a problem, especially since McCone's already kind of made this deal. And this is where Lawrence came in. Lawrence is kind of on the more McCone side, although he winds up becoming not only so allied with um, the Arab leaders, including King Hussein, that he's like, man, he has a lot of sympathy for the Arabs and he really doesn't like some of the things that the British are doing. So at some point he starts doing things that aren't exactly what the British wanted. It's really, it's really interesting. It's a, um, a very complex history. All right. Oh man, look at the text on text. So the Sykes Agreement seems to ignore the previous promise. When McCone finds about it, he resigns because he's like, "What the heck? I gave my word as a, you know, a servant to the queen." Um, and so he resigns <coughs> in a fury, and they're like, uh, "Okay, we're still going to take over the Middle East." And um, the sykes pico Agreement was signed on May 16th, 1916, but it wasn't made public till a year and a half later. Um, and so McCone didn't know about it for a while. You know, Lawrence didn't know about it for a while. Um, and Hussein, King Hussein didn't know about it for a while. And actually this is still considered one of the main problems in the Middle East now. Uh, we have this little quote from 2002. I wonder what was going on in the Middle East in 2002. 
hmm, I'll ask this before your time. So 9-11 was 2001, and then obviously we did a lot of bombing and invasions and stuff. Uh, the British Foreign Secretary at the time, who was like our Secretary of State, one of the more, one of the most powerful um, officials and the most powerful foreign official in uh, the British government says a lot of the problems to in the UK has to deal with right now at the time they were well they still are they were allied with us and we were you know invading Afghanistan eventually Iraq that kind of thing um, and of course there's always problems in Israel and Palestine um, you know and in 2002 this guy's like yeah a lot of those problems that the UK has to deal with has to deal with their colonial past and this is a huge part of what he was referencing um, so it gets even better because, um, on November 2nd, 1917, um, the UK's foreign secretary, uh, Arthur Balfour sends a letter to the Rothschilds and the Rothschilds were, are a, um, extremely powerful, um, and rich, like, like they funded the Napoleonic Wars. Like when Napoleon starts going and taking over Europe, um, the British are like, uh, we can't, we don't have enough money to fight this guy. And he was like the best, he was like, Napoleon's like a military genius. He's taking over Europe, you know, something people thought was impossible. Um, and the British are like, uh, what do we do? And uh, we don't have any money. And so literally, you know, a huge portion of the whole war against Napoleon uh, was financed by the Rothschilds because, you know, they're that rich and powerful. Um, so just incredibly powerful banking family. Uh, and so he sends a letter to the Rothschild and it's publicized a week later and it becomes known as the Balfour Declaration. Rothschild was obviously still powerful and the Rothschilds were still powerful in World War One, and they helped finance um, good parts of World War One on the British side. So, you know, People want to be nice to them, and here is the letter that Balfour sent. <coughs> Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful to you if you'll bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Signed, Balfour. Yeah, so, you know, this is in the, the text is here. Uh, again, it seems to contradict the promises made in the Macon Hussein correspondence. And uh, it's a little, you know, it's, it's, it's a modification of the sykes pico agreement, although it doesn't substantially change the sykes pico agreement. Um, so what does this paragraph mean? Um, you can pause the video if you really want to try to figure it out on your own. I mean, this is a good example of, you know, legalese you know, how legal and government documents are written, um, basically saying, yeah, you can go into Palestine and create your own Jewish nation. And, you know, be nice to the people who are there, treat them good, and you're just going to be so fair. And, you know, not that they're probably planning on being mean, but if people are living on land, and then someone's like, oh, yeah, that's your land now, go make it a country. How are the original people going to feel about that? Anyway, um, so this happens, um, and over the course of the next uh, few decades, people start moving in there. Um, Jews especially start moving in there, and they're living in Palestine, and the proportion of Jewish immigrants goes up, and Jewish settlers go up. Um, there's a good amount of money behind this. Um, you know, very people from the time are getting involved in it. Actually, I just finished a biography on Albert Einstein. He was recruited to, you know, support this at different times. Uh, and so, you know, there this movement actually starts happening, the Zionist kind of movement. Um, and um, this leads to a revolt in British Palestine. Um, and 
the, by, by the Arabs who don't want to be controlled by the British anymore. Cause they're like, Hey, listen, first we said, you said you're going to give us our freedom. That is part of this whole, you know, fight against the Ottomans. Second, we were trying to get freedom even before you were here. Cause we were trying to get it from the Ottomans. Third, like what the heck fourth, you're telling other people they can just come and like live in Palestine, our area. Like that's fine. People can immigrate, but like, this is a lot. And you're kind of saying that it's theirs now, like what's going on here, you know, come on. So um, in response, the British prime minister at the time, Neville, we shall have peace in our time. Chamberlain uh, issued the white paper of 1939. So um, good, good kind of side note on Chamberlain. Um, Chamberlain, you'll notice he has that lovely, uh, you know, nickname, we shall have peace in our time. Uh, he, that, that quote is very, very well known because um, also in 1938, might have been early 39, either late 38, um, early 39, um, Hitler had already taken over parts of Czechoslovakia and uh, twice, I think. And so the second time, um, the you know the Britain and, and other countries in Europe are like, whoa, brr, hello, you, you can't just go on and take things over like that. We we have to have a meeting. And so Hitler's like, oh yeah, a meeting. And so they go and have a meeting. And uh, England's like, you can't just go on and take people over. And Hitler's like, oh, I'm sorry, I did not know. That's really bad German. Anyway, um, so, and he's like, I'm all done now. No more conquering. It's okay. And he's like, there better not be any more conquering. If you do, you're going to get it. And he's like, oh, we're going to have a war. And he's like, oh, just don't do it. And he, Hitler's like, okay. And um, P.S. Hitler does it. He invades Poland in 1939, September. Um, Anyway, um, before he invades Poland, after this whole meeting, uh, Vienna, I think, um, Chamberlain flies back to England and all the reporters are there. They're like, you know, how to go with Hitler? Is Hitler going to take over more countries? Is Europe going to go to war? They were still like tired from World War I. They didn't want to fight another war. Um, the economy was bad. The Great Depression was obviously going on in America, but it was, you know, hitting you know, most of the world pretty badly. Um, and so people were really suffering in a bad way. And um, Neville Chamberlain gets off the plane, marches down the plane steps and goes to the podium and says, we shall have peace in our time. Then a few months later, World War II starts, you know, the most dangerous, deadly conflict in human history. So don't be Neville Chamberlain. Um, so he precedes, you know, the involvement in World War II with what he calls a white paper. And a white paper um, is a term that is used not only in government, but also in academic circles or even among companies. It's kind of a, um, uh, like an outline of guidance. Typically, it's pretty short. White papers are, you know, couple thousand words, maybe even a little bit less. Um, and it just kind of, it's not always rules, but it kind of more expresses wishes and guidelines and kind of provides a path forward. Um, and so this white paper as a policy paper that outlines the governance of British Palestine, including a restriction on Jewish immigrants. So, you know, first they promised the Arabs their freedom, then they divided up with France and they, you know, give a uh, part of Palestine to where Arabs were living, to Jews, and they tell the Jews, oh yeah, well you, you can't really move there as much as you want, right? And so in reaction to the white paper, Ben Gurion, who becomes the first prime minister of Israel later says, peace in Palestine is not the best situation for thwarting the policy of the white paper, which is a nice way of saying, hey, if you don't like the white paper, go shoot some stuff, and they did. Um, so the uh, Arab revolt, in um, 36, 39, also caused the British mandate to support and favor Zionist militias because the Zionist militias were kind of um, already having some conflicts with the Arabs because, you know, they landed on their country and started trying to make their own country and that can create problems. Um, but the British are like, well, hey, the Arabs are trying to fight us and the Zionists don't mind fighting the Arabs, so let's help out the Zionists. And by the way, we shall have peace in our time. Thank you, Neville Chamberlain. Um, 
And so uh, there's that. And so this is where we're talking about, this is the same kind of areas. Um, just as a reminder, um, the whole yellowish grayish area is really what we're talking about. Israel is in yellow and Palestine was now um, considered by the UN and most countries in the world to be Palestine is um, in gray. The US does not recognize Palestine because Israel doesn't recognize Palestine um, because of stuff. Uh, and actually when you follow politics, which you should start doing as we've talked about before, um, and you know, especially the upcoming uh, presidential election, great time to you know, kind of get yourself hooked into American politics so you can start developing those uh, opinions and stuff for your own. Um, at least one of the candidates, uh, Biden at some point, I don't know if he still supports it now, I think so, has uh, offered what's called a two-state solution to the conflicts in this area of the world. And basically what a two-state solution is, is that um, on US maps, official US um, you know, like government maps, uh, this gray part doesn't exist, right? It's just yellow, it's all yellow. And so the two-state solution is um, make the gray part its own country. Um, and that has its own series of complications, but it is what it is. Um, so when you hear about that, the two-state solution, the two-state solution means make countries, mostly the U.S., recognize this part as having two different colors on the map, whereas right now um, the U.S. treats uh, the gray parts as if they were parts of the yellow part, part of Israel. So, okay, uh, World War II happens. And during World War II, uh, Ben Gurion says, support the British as if there were no white paper and oppose the white paper as if there were no war. Because that's really, you know, straightforward on how to act. Um, what winds up happening is about 10% of the Jewish population, so a you know, good proportion, um, volunteers for the British Army. Um, and in World War II, various paramilitary groups, so like not really parts of the army, but people who have guns and weapons and maybe some military support are engaged in violent and terrorist acts against British while um, all this is going on and people are trying to figure out, okay, what's going to go on with this region, this country, not a country, Arabs, Jews, who, if it is going to be a country, whose is it, that kind of stuff. Um, and so in 48, the British mandate, the rule of Palestine ends, right? Because after World War II, England is, or Great Britain is like, okay, this whole imperialism thing, it's tough. And we're kind of done with it. And we're really beat up from World War II. So they start relinquishing um, parts of their empire because it was also starting to be a bad look. You know, so there's, there's lots of reasons why they start giving up their empire. Um, but they do, and that includes uh, letting this, the provisions of the British mandate over Palestine kind of end, the sunset. So there's a sunset clause saying, you know, unless until we update it, this is where our control is going to end. And they just kind of let it end. They didn't update it. And so the next day, uh, so on that day, Ben-Gurion declares the existence of the state of Israel. And the next day, conflicts between Arabs and the newly declared state of Israel begin. And there have been off and on conflicts, some of them full out war, some of them just, you know, missiles and deaths on each side occurring. Um, you know, there, there are people who have died this year because of conflicts in between the um, yellow and gray areas, which are believed to be the U.S. entirely yellow. Um, you know, there's just deaths kind of over this all the time. Um, and some of it are more serious, some of them are, I mean, all deaths are serious, but sometimes it's just kind of conflicts and tear gas and rock throwing and a few bullets, and sometimes it's, you know, missiles and missiles and missiles being shot down and tanks and, you know, um, big bombings as opposed to smaller ones, so it's, um, and that always ebbs and flows. Um, so, and there's been, there was a big kind of war in the 60s, a very brief but important war. You know, uh, Egypt was involved, the U.S. gets dragged into it. It's, uh, it's, 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 been, it's been a mess, and it continues to be. So uh, right now, um, Israel and Arabs lived in the Israeli-controlled West Bank, Gaza, and Golan Heights. So those are the gray areas we saw, right? And the, Israel is the yellow country. 
um, and Israel occupies these and um, is, you know, these West Bank Gaza Golan Heights are, are from a non-US perspective, they are um, things that should be their own nation. And there are agreements about who controls these. So there's like a government within Israel that is um, like under Israel that has, so like this area has two governments, the main Israeli government, but then there's also a Palestinian government that is, uh, parts of it are recognized by Israel it, and then parts of it are not. It's uh, it's very mess. It's very messy. It's the longest military occupation in modern times by Israel because these people don't want to be under Israel. So both have attacked each other. Both have committed acts that the other have said is terrorism and both have committed acts that any normal person would be like, yeah, that's like terrorist activity. Um, the U.S. has not recognized Palestine. The Palestinians have sought legal recognition for their state, and in 2014, the UN recognized Palestine as a non-member observer status. Um, and um, the um, Palestine-based groups have launched attacks against Israel. A lot of them have been funded by other countries, um, specifically Iran, um, and uh, some of these Palestinian groups like Hezbollah um, have... Um, you know, are not nice. Um, and then, you know, some of the ways Israel has conducted itself has not been nice also. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's very problematic. So uh, if you look at the map, all the countries in green are countries that have rec recognized the existence of Palestine. You'll notice a lot of the countries that are not in green are um, countries that are closely aligned to the U.S. And uh, this perspective has been heavily influenced by the U.S. Um, because of the U.S. has a very unique and special and like, you know, we're brothers but closer relationship with Israel. Um, we kind of use Israel as a real foothold into that whole region. Um, a very, you know, um, close and powerful ally to Israel is um, very technologically advanced state in many ways, especially when it comes to weapons. Israel also is suspected by some to have um, nuclear capability, although that's not really clear. They definitely haven't announced that they do, but um, some have worked under the impression that this is so. Um, whether it's true or not, it's, you know, they say it's not true. Um, so who knows? But, um, you know, either way, they, you know, Israel gets all of our, all of our military stuff, typically not top, top of the line, but like, you know, stuff that we still use. that isn't like the actual brand newest. They get like that kind of stuff. So they get a lot of funding from us. We give them hundreds of millions of not billions of dollars every year. Um, and then we give them, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars of weapons and stuff. So, um, you know, we're very close allies. So, uh, that said, that hasn't stopped the conflicts in Palestine and, um, Israel. So that's what's going on now. <sighs> okay. So um, most of what is going to come up in the book is going to be in that white paper era, because um, that's the time of the book and a little bit after the white paper during World War II, obviously. And um, the creation of the state of Israel becomes a real uh, point of notice in the chosen. So when that comes up, they talk about Ben Gurion is actually mentioned and that kind of stuff. Um, when that comes up and like these different groups and these attacks are going to all be mentioned in the chosen. So you have a little background for what's going on there. Obviously, that was a very broad overview and we went way further back than things are going to go in the chosen, but that's just because this whole region has become really politicized, especially in America. Um, and so it's important to have historical factual context for what's been going on in that area for a long time, right? You know, so if you read about or hear about people talking about that area, you know, a lot of American news and commentary, they'll be like, oh, there's always been conflict in the Middle East. It's like, no, there hasn't been, right? Um, you know, and the Ottomans controlled it. it for hundreds of years, different religious groups got along just fine. Um, and there wasn't any conflict. So, you know, um, just kind of giving that broader perspective, not only what's going on 
during the book and going on now, but even a little before that, how that came to be, you know, um, you know. So, for instance, the like the Sykes Pico agreement has huge ramifications even now. One of the first acts ISIS did. Um, when ISIS was taking over territory and taking over the country, this is a, a huge deal for them. They actually took bulldozers and they, they put this all on social media. This is like one of the things they really pushed. They took bulldozers and they just bulldozed like this dirt uh, in the middle of the desert. And, um, you know, a lot of people who weren't really informed in this history were just like, why, why is this? Why are they making such a big deal out of this? And they were bulldozing away the sykes Pico line it's not you know oftentimes it's not marked but you know you can go to the coordinates that are listed shown on that map and find those coordinates on the ground like gps and they just plowed right through them to show we don't you know they're because isis they, obviously they're crazy terrorists and very violent but part of their thing was you know they were against like western control and that kind of thing and they thought you know the west was trying to you know do stuff and it, it starts getting crazy there um you know terrorist stuff but um you know they knew their history and they know a lot of craziness also but you know part of this was recognizing they're trying to build their own nation they build their own state and you know a lot of the lines that are drawn in the middle east are just just seriously just like drunk europeans over a map it's crazy um you know the, the Iraq has conflict, right? And there's a bunch of different tribal groups in Iraq. Syria has conflict. There's a bunch of different tribal groups in Syria. Well, why is that? Well, because those two countries, you know, ethnically and nationally, historically, uh, tribally have not been the same country. You're just kind of smushing different cultures together and saying, okay, you're a country now. And I know some of your culture goes over into Syria, but you know, that's, we drew that line. So different countries, come on. And it's just all a mess. So yeah, uh, we're still seeing obviously some of the complications and complexities of that today right now. Um, all stuff that is going on in the shows. And this is a really good example of why, you know, even when you're reading fiction, um, you know, it's not nonfiction. Obviously I do my nonfiction on Audible, totally cool. So obviously I, I do a bit of both, but, um, I prefer personally fiction for a variety of reasons. And, and one of them is, is even with fiction, with a lot of fiction, you can still figure out a lot about the world. Um, and to understand fiction, you have to understand the world. You know, this is a great example, but it doesn't even have to be this, right? I mean, if you're, do I have a copy of it? Yeah. Like, so this, is, uh, so this is like a complete fantasy science fiction book, Dune by Frank Herbert. It's, considered like oh, one of the best fantasy science fiction books like it's crazy you know i'm into science fiction fantasy i've told you guys that um and this is just completely made up like aliens like you know these are sandworms i don't know if you oh yeah they're crazy um you know it's just like robots and all kinds of stuff um but it's also a clear commentary on oil in the middle east and so even when you're reading like random science fiction that takes place in other worlds and they're, you know, I have kind of like mind reading like alternate universe drugs and they're, you know, got these like force fields and lasers and you know, all this kind of like obviously science fiction fantasy stuff like mystics and all this. When you're reading this, you're going to realize like hey, there's some stuff going on here and the more you know and research it you realize oh in some ways this is a real allegory for what's going on or you know there's a lot of symbolism here of what's going on in our world um and the way things are and the way we treat resources and that kind of thing so um it's a really good example of how even you know, reading a story that's completely made up, right? Like Danny and Ruben never existed. You know, Dune definitely didn't exist, right? I mean, this is complete imagination. Um, reading fiction, you can learn about our world and the world around you um, in really interesting ways. So pretty cool stuff. Um, 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know that was long. It's not super related to, um, you know, the book. I mean, it, it's very related to the book, but it's not like critical in terms of like any of the assignments and stuff. But if you're reading something and it's telling you about our world and our history, like, and we don't investigate that, what's, that's not learning. So some time for learning, even if it's not going to be directly points related. So, um, you know, there you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hope you guys are doing well. I'm uh, thinking of you guys only a couple more weeks, which is just crazy. Um, but uh, let's power through, finish strong. And I look forward to um, getting through these next couple of weeks with you guys. All right. See you guys later.